Of our, um, many of our uh, staff will help you with this. Oftentimes they fill it out for you. Uh, but I will remind everyone that it is your responsibility to ensure that all your numbers and your name is on file. Otherwise, you'll be getting a phone call or an email from me saying, what happened that day? I thought you were here. Um, so, so know that before you leave, just double check the staff to make sure that that's filled out for you. If not, you're welcome to do it yourself. Um, and, and we can keep counting accurately um, ab about what we need. Comments and feedback is a nice addition. Yes. Nice people have, if they didn't sign into the book but they share things, that it's nice for us to be able to pass on. Absolutely. So there is a, another little area, like a little line on the end that allows you to write some feedback. Um, that could be anything from, it was sunny so it was really busy, to met this one great couple and shared a lot of time with them. Hi Rita, come on in. Um, and, and really allowed that engagement to to be uh, to be recorded in the long term. Well, and that feedback is really important. We collect that across all of our spaces. Um, visitor engagement station. For any of uh, Dave, I know is up at the visitor engagement station. We actually collect that from the volunteers, and it helps us learn kind of what's going on from day to day. Um, if for some reason, there happened to be a day where you guys got a lot of questions about a particular something and you didn't have the answer. It helps us better define what information we're giving you and how better we can equip you as we go forward. So all of that feedback is really, really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, Jane. Plus, um, the hours you write down, those are the hours that are entered on your hours work. People sometimes think it's just you pick a shift and that's what shows up but actually you enter the hours we work. I do so if there's a change I go through every week and cross check that you both showed up for your shift and that something didn't change but if it's indicated that your hours are different than that three hour block I do adjust that either on the plus or the minus side so I double check all of those hours every week to make sure I'm accurately accounting for the time that you're there um, and and I know that that impacts your benefits and how and how many of you uh, interact with other areas of the garden. Just having that total of hours accurately is really important. So I will make those adjustments for you if something changes or if some of those hours are different than what's listed. So thank you for pointing that out, Jane. Yes, Ellen. Um The hours that we record are like to the hour or to the ha 30, yes. 30 minutes or extra yes. hours. Or yes, yes, Gen generally speaking, hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 15 minutes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's fair. We do that for if we visited someplace else in another city. Yes, ma'am. Is that still going to be so? So, account? thank you for bringing that up. That's a good so. So, many of you know that if you travel or if you engage in any type of continuing education, so say you go to one of the member speaker series talks here on Guardian Grounds, or, or you go to the organized education continuing education sessions, or if you're traveling and you go someplace and see something else, those credits are marked at an hour. Okay. Um, so even if you were there the entire day, I can only give you an hour. But if you provide me a brochure, um, you send me an email and kind of talk through it with me and say, this was really great, I really enjoyed going here, or you have other resources, and say you pin it to the bulletin board in the basement of Tower Grove House and say, this was a really great experience, or check this out online. Um, then, then you would have to alert me to do to that because I have to go in and enter that for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. But as long as you alert me to that, I can take care of it for you. So if you sign up some, for something like a, a class or something that the garden has on service, then will you get that hour, or do we need to tell you? About if that? if it's something that's registered on service, then your hours are being counted. Mm -hmm. So so. Th the continuing education portion, if it's, if for example, you signed up with one of Andrea's like large continuing education experiences, like you're, we have talks from all types of people, um, then if you're registered on service, the hour is already counted. But if you go to something different, uh, even out in the community, I know Tower Grove Park is having lots of more talks now and things about history that I've become aware of recently, if you go to anything that's not on service, then I would need to be alerted to it to put it in for you. Thank Never you for speakers. clarifying that. Never speaker 
talks have now gone into service. So right. that's good. So all, so all that should be very easy to sign up for. Yes, Andrea. Andrea is the keeper of this. Hello. <laughs> and well, just to clarify with that, the member speaker series talks have been added into the 2018 education volunteer continuing education opportunities just to make it easier for everyone. We we were getting feedback from volunteers that it was hard to sign up for the web on the website and on service. So I just put it in one place and then I'm submitting those RSVPs to membership directly. So if you've already RSVP'd on the website for member speaker series, that is okay. But to make it a little easier for you, you can sign up on service and I will RSVP for you <laughs> and you'd still get the credit. Uh, what I wanted to say is to make sure that when you, when you like for those who's, who are coming tomorrow, someone from education, whether it be myself, Becky Donovan, sometimes Haley, to please make sure you sign in because just like you track your stats or you track attendance at these meetings, we're tracking your attendance if you come to these opportunities. Does that make sense? So please sign in with someone, education related, who will be there. Um, if, you, if it's crowded and you sign up with a, me with a membership staff, that's okay because I go through that list also. So please make sure you sign in. If you run in and sneak in and we don't see you, you may not get credit for being there. And we want to make sure you get credit for being there. I just wanted to clarify Thank that. You, Thank you for the question. Yes, of Does course. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you have trouble finding that link on service, alert one of myself or Andrea to that so that way we can help you find where those opportunities lie to sign up for because mm -hmm. they're not going to say anything about Tri Grove House. They live in the in the big bubble of education volunteering that might look a little bit different, um, but but are on service for for you to sign up for. Okay, great. What else do I have on here? Bullet one. Bullet one. Yeah. Because nobody showed up to help me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> This says volunteer support. So I wanted to share with you that in the middle of this year, you will be receiving volunteer support from other um, friends of mine here, Andrea Harper there in the back, uh, Jen Wolf, or our volunteer office, Scott Bahan, because I will be on maternity leave yeah. starting in July. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I um, will be relying heavily on the rest of our team to make sure that you have what you need during that time. Um, if you have any of the normal challenges that you would need from me, I have lots of people who can help you take care of those things. Uh, in addition, if you need to call to cancel a shift or things like that, I'm working out a system to figure out who's the best person to call so we're not worried about where you are or, or what's happening because many of you are very good about calling me if something has changed, um, but know that I will be returning to you uh, in September, uh, a few pounds heavier, but just as cheery. So, <laughs> <laughs> a little more yeah. <laughs> house phone number. So As here's the thing. Change. Here's the thing. So, so we updated our phone system all over the garden. Uh, many of us were able to retain the same phone number. Tower Grove House, the one, the the phone number that ends in one five zero. That phone number still works. Yes. That still connects you to Tower Grove House. If you're trying to reach my office at Tower Grove House, that's a different phone number that I honestly don't even have memorized. So, so if you're trying to reach someone at Tower Grove House and you call the 150 extension, you're going to get whomever is at the receptive desk. Okay. And that's, that's the main number for the majority of the house for some reason the office phone ended up with a different phone number, which is complicated. It's really complicated, but basically the new phone system is all internet based and the Tower Grove house phone with the reception desk is analog. So that is running on a separate system. So and know now that if you call Tower Grove house and no one answers for some reason, either we're busy or someone is not there, in theory, it should transfer you to my voicemail at my main desk. Right. So, so if you leave a message, you should be hearing my voice saying, you have reached Haley O'Toole. And, and, and so it should be transferring all of those calls if you call the 150 number and you don't. And so you don't. The 150 number is the no, main number of the garden and extension 150? No. And I don't know what the number is. So, so, what is our first? 577 5105. Five, 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 five
This is your office. No. That's the Tower Grove House phone number. Oh, okay. okay. Cool. What's cool about the system, though, is that I get your voicemail faster, even if I'm not here. So now all of our voicemails transfer to emails. So you can listen to it on your email, which is actually really convenient if you're out doing other things. So. <laughs> you're going to talk. Oh, that is it? Oh, okay. Security. Mm-hmm. Only wait till Jen. Okay. So trying not to scratch my fingernails. Like, I don't want. None of us want that. Oh no. Mm -hmm. That just gave me chills. Does <laughs> <laughs> no. it security number, Jen? It no. Yes. And can you put security on there, Jen? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Security, or are we looking for the? I think the main desk. Yeah. Right. Jeanette, the main like if security we, like desk. Like if we were in Tower Grove House and we had an emergency and mm -hmm. needed security, so the number we would use, I assume, on the house phone. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm gonna. I'll show you how to know what that is. Um, I'm just gonna. Okay. So here. So, so here's. Here's the way to know if you're inside the garden and you need to dial any extension. Basically, this is our new extension. It's these five numbers. That's why all of us were looking at our badges because we're accustomed to just dialing these. So for security, if you were a Tower Grove House, you would dial 70212. If you're a Tower Grove House and you want to call Haley's office in Ridgeway, it's 79425. So one thing we talked about at our last meeting is that we were going to get a new little tag yes. thing. Yes, so what's been the holdup is we've had a few people, like Andrea had a had a normal phone number, but on top of this, Andrea also then had a five-digit extension. So what we've been working to do is for some people like Andrea Hart, we're trying to get them a direct phone number so you didn't have to call a phone number and then another five numbers. So we've been working that out with IT. So Andrea's number just got changed and we have a few others. And I'm trying to and adjust my desk situation at Tower Grove House and to we're eliminate trying, that number. We're trying to figure out what the phone number is at the Tower Grove House desk and why we have to have two house phone numbers. Well, and how many numbers do we need on our little thing? Right, exactly. So we're trying to make sure that it's as targeted as possible so that you guys don't have what we have. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for that. So the only thing left on here are always my friendly reminders of when we need help. Um, we, we start off running this year um, because of when Easter falls. Our opening weekend is still technically March 31st. And April 1st, April 1st being Easter. Um, but we're considering this more of a soft opening and that that's when trams will resume. That's when the house will be open and some of those seasonal things will return. But our big, big opening season event will be the next weekend for me, that Meet Me Outdoors in St. Louis event will be the 7th and 8th that next weekend to try to accommodate for the holidays taking place that first weekend. <coughs> I also added on here the museum building opening because it's going to be real busy, I would bet. And so, so that's a, the last weekend of April, the very end of the month. Um, <coughs> even though there will be lots of calls for volunteering in lots of other places, Tower Grove House is getting a new neighbor. So we need to be well represented 
uh, and staffed as well. Uh, so I'm going to indicate that on service. I don't think I've done so yet, but I'll indicate that date on service so you know if you're interested in being a part of those festivities, um, when you can sign up. It's also important to note that Chinese Culture Days has moved this year because of our summer exhibit. So Chinese Culture Days is real early this year. Um, and so, so, so Hila, that museum opening is just that weekend. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's when it will become open to the public. It will be open to the public starting that weekend. Oh, and then continuously. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Wow. And yes. it's seven days of. Yeah. It's every day, isn't it? That is. That yes. well. That's my current understanding yes. is that it will be yes. open seven days a week, starting. Um, there is a member preview on the. 27th or the evening, the Friday. Uh, isn't it Friday? I think it's Saturday. 27th? We're trying to keep track of things. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. They organized the volunteers when happened the 29th. That's Saturday and Sunday. Right, but I'm. I think you I, might be right. No, I think it's, there's a member preview on that Saturday night. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then that Sunday morning, it will be open to the public. And it will be time tickets because the garden is anticipating quite a large crowd to see it. Mm -hmm. So it will be time ticketed. Um, and then you asked about volunteers. So Neshka Pfeiffer is the new museum curator. She and I have been talking quite regularly along with Haley and several others around the garden. I did share with her our conversation that education does have, at least interpretation, we have uh, about 250 volunteers who are all raising hands, willing to support so um, we're working on those details um, as she's only just finished her second week at the garden. Um, she's not originally from St. Louis, so she's got a lot to kind of get. Neshka, N-E-Z-K-A, Neshka Pfeiffer. She's the new museum curator. So we are working out what that looks like. She sees the logic in that, why would we go out and recruit brand new volunteers with only a few weeks to go when we already have quite a few volunteers who have a lot of the knowledge already, at least of the history, might not have the knowledge right now of the restoration work that's been done, but that can certainly be learned. Um, and No, nobody else has that either, exactly. Um, and that there's quite a few of you that are um, eager to participate in that capacity. So um, as we have more details, we will definitely share that with you all. Yes, yes. So that, so there could be lots of spots to fill that day, both in Tower Grove House, as well as in other areas of the garden. Um, and you're talking the weekend of the 24th? Uh, the 28th. Uh, April. Yes. And then Henry Shaw's birthday is always on here. <laughs> That's a fun day. That is a fun day. <laughs> it's a fun day that I'm sad to say I most likely will be missing. <laughs> you'll be having fun. Yeah, you'll be having fun. What is your The 14th. Oh, yeah. So, so. Yes. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, right? I'll just pop in. But we always need support that day. I put it on here because I believe it's Tuesday this year. Mm -hmm. So it's a different day than we're normally open. But we will be open for that day. Yes. And you'll see that appear on service. So are you open that evening as well? No. Okay. Just during the day. So those are some of your dates to remember to look for that will have special monikers on service if you really like the crowds and are ready to have a good time at an event. I would also encourage you, you know, we're all creatures of habit and the garden has had a long history of dates. Like Whitaker is always during these months and Member Tuesdays right now are always during these months. This year with the summer exhibit, there's a lot of things that are being kind of moved around yes. a little bit. So things like Whitaker will start a little earlier. Remember Tuesdays, I believe, is Chinese only Culture Tuesdays Days is like in a June. Month early. Yeah. So oh, I'm asking for your flexibility and um, and knowing that some things are being moved around in order to accommodate this very special summer exhibit. So. What's been tradition for many of us is a little untraditional this year. <laughs> so you're saying then that the Whitaker thing will be done with before the new Flora thing starts? Oh, well, that's wow. going to really... Mm -hmm. And they have to still... Yeah. Couple, they they couple still have to get in those 10 yeah. weeks wow. because of the Whitaker funding. Oh, wow. yeah. um, and so some things have been moved around in order to accommodate. I think there's just one or two that overlap. I think it's... Hmm. Well... Yeah. So, but, um, but not many. Not many. Mm. I, 
So the other thing the garden is embarking this year is we now finally, for staff, have an internal garden-wide calendar that we just, um, you would kind of go, how come the garden hasn't had that before? Well, believe it or not, we haven't. So when we give you guys dates for things, we've usually had to check a variety of different departments, divisions, calendars, different things in order to get that to you. Um, and so we're proud, finally, to have a garden-wide calendar that multiple divisions are feeding. So ideally, we should have one source to go to for information. So that just started last week, last mm -hmm. week Monday. Yeah. And so people like myself and others are responsible for populating that with the events that we are responsible for. So um, I hope to be able to share that with you guys in the, in the months to come. So you won't be able to look up the calendar itself, but we will have a print copy of some sort available. Mm -hmm. So when this Flora thing starts on June 28th, will the garden still be open till 5 for people during the day, or will they close early? I don't know that I can, well, no, it would still be open because be open. Yeah. Flora is going to start at like 7. Oh, yeah, it's okay. a night, it has to be dark. It has oh, to be okay. dark, and okay. so you know when sun sets. People don't like it when the garden closes. No. no. You know when sun sets in the summertime, yeah, so it's, right. I think it's more of a 7 to 11 okay. kind of event. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a little past my bed time, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so I don't, it, unless I hear otherwise, I'm not anticipating that the garden's gonna close before five to reopen at seven, but there's gonna be a lot happening. There's gonna be a beer garden on Linnean Plaza. Um, through a donation, we have a huge tent um, that's gonna cover I think it's like 25 feet by 70 feet on Linnean Plaza and that's going to go up middle of next month and then be up through October of some time. Um, so it'll be up for Best of Mo, Henry Shaw dinner, it'll be where the beer garden is um, during the summer event, so quite a few changes in additions this year. Is there training for this thing too? Is there for floor borealis? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, as soon as we determine what the raw materials are. <laughs> yeah. We're still waiting to get some information. So even though things will be projected on Tire Girl Pals, Tire Girl Pals will not be open. Yeah, yeah no. So, uh -huh. But there will be other volunteer opportunities, we hope. Yes. Um, We're either, anticipating them. Either directing folks to the right place, helping them stay on the path, um, helping make sure that the interactive elements are, are working and, and supported. So, so more information will come, surely. Um, when they ask us for volunteers, we will certainly pass that need along. Yes, Jeanette. How will the Flora Borealis be every night? Every night from June. Well, for the most mm -hmm. part, except for the few nights yeah. that would occur. Like June 28th intersect. to August 26th is what it said on here. Is that every night? I I don't know if I can, there was a staff calendar that was published. I will see if I can get that information for you. I would just ask maybe if it's possible for a garden member to liaison with the neighborhood organizations in terms of parking. Because we experience issues with garden doors. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. If we can anticipate and know in the Shaw neighborhood what, sure, what, indeed. You know, what is the events and time frame. Let me see if I can get that information for you. I know that they just announced at the staff mm -hmm. meeting Thursday mm -hmm. um, that calendar for Flora Borealis. Let me see if I can get that because I know it's not online quite yet. No, I don't think No, they gave like the dates, Jen, but not yeah. but th that calendar was not posted. <laughs> Do you guys have any other questions before we move away from the agenda? Are we doing okay? Do we need some more Danish? Great. <laughs> Before I start the presentation, are we doing okay? Okay. So like I mentioned, the goal of, of having a little presentation here today is to do a little skills refresher um, and and offer us the opportunity to to um, think more about the way that we do what we do. Sometimes it's easy to just become um, complacent or just say the same things over and over and over again because we've done it for so long and that's how the brain works. Um, and so I'm trying to get our brains 
open and to think about how we deliver that information in maybe a little bit different way so that way we can continue to engage with all types of volunteers. Um, I also, selfishly, know that many of you have been volunteering for a wide variety of years and so the amount of training or the different types of training that you received over the years is surely different. So I'm hoping that there's at least one thing in this presentation here today that you can take away from this regardless of how many years you've been enjoying time at Tower Group House. Are we all on board? Okay, so far. I'll take so far. I think in going through a lot of my new volunteer training materials, I recognize that it's really important to us that we continually help our new volunteers learn exactly what interpretation is. Um, and so if that definition has never been in front of you, I wanted to make sure that you had that opportunity because the definition um, as defined by the National Association of Interpretation uh, is, very, is very pointed in helping us acknowledge that interpretation is a communication process. So it's not us lecturing, it's not me writing a novel for you to repeat, it's not robots standing up there saying the same thing every time or pushing a button. It's a process that means that you're providing some information and then you're receiving feedback from another person to help guide you in having a conversation. Uh, it's much more conversationally based than it is an opportunity to lecture or to just spew out some facts that hopefully stick somewhere in their mind. Uh, it has to do with how they are hearing what you're saying and processing it based on their life experience to make those connections um, between whatever they're interested in and the content of what you're trying to share. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So how do we make those connections? We make those connections in a variety of ways, but these that are listed here come from Freeman Tilden, who was the first person, uh, circa about 1957, 1960, who started to really formalize the field of interpretation. He worked for the National Park Service and was more or less the first person to say that interpretation is an intentional action. It's, it's not the same as sitting in a classroom, it's not the same as writing a book, or just talking through some factual information, that there's ways to find meaningful connections to people based on the information you're trying to share. So you, you all have heard me perhaps say on many occasions that um, this relate is the first thing that I really stick to because finding ways to create those relatable moments come from ensuring that I'm constantly telling myself that information is not interpretation. All of those facts and wonderful things that we learn are really important. It helps keep us interested, it helps keep us excited, but just having that factual information isn't necessarily providing those really enriching experiences because that doesn't take into account what the other person is interested in, what their life experience is, what their holistic reason for being here today at the garden is. And so finding those different things that relate people to the content of what you're sharing is really, really important. That's why it's at the very top of this list. Because once you can provide an opportunity for, relate, for relation, that's when revelation begins. That, that's when the wheels start turning for a lot of our visitors. Um, my goal, generally speaking, is not ever to get out everything I have to say when I'm giving an introduction, but to say enough that someone asks me a question in return. Because if they're asking me a question, that means that whatever I'm sharing is somewhere in there rolling around, either they're thinking, she's crazy, I don't know what this is, or I really like this, what does that mean? If they're asking you a question in return, they're starting to put together the content of what you're sharing. Um, and so, so taking the opportunity to create those questionable moments really allow us the opportunity to 
have a little bit deeper connection instead of just being the talking head that turns on when someone walks in the door. The goal, again, is provocation and finding those next steps, but finding it in an age-appropriate way. So as many of you know, many of our visitors are adult or older, but we also have a lot of younger visitors who relate to the material in very different ways. Um, and, and I appreciate so much, and many of you have the same experiences, seeing that the provocation tool is a lot easier with kids because they're accustomed to asking questions and feeling comfortable inside asking questions. There's something about growing up that makes all those <laughs> willingness to ask questions kind of go away. Um, and so, so really finding what the most age appropriate is, because that, again, has a lot to do with life experience. If, if you're talking to someone who's much older, their life experience and reasons for being interested in being there are going to be a lot different than why a school group might be visiting us or a family might be visiting us. So being very mindful of the fact that even if the introduction that you provide when people walk in the door sounds really great, it might not be connecting with everybody in the group. It might not be something that is the most provoking for them to think through because they're of a different age bracket or they are clearly interested in something else. Many of you also have the experience, as do I, the people walk through the door and they're not really interested yet. They're, they're just coming in because it's a part of the tour and then we're having to find ways to create those opportunities and, and sometimes just starting to talk and give our introduction, that's not gonna click. That's not something that they're really interested in. It takes a little bit more to start asking those questions, allow people to get comfortable with you and then offer some more of that meaty content about why they're here, what the mission of the garden is, and things like that. It's very important to us that we always remember that interpretation has a purpose, and that seems obvious to say, but I think there are times where um, it's easy to say the same things over and over again without consciously thinking what am I trying to share with this person? If there's only one thing that this person is gonna take home with them and tell their family, I went to the garden and I learned this, what is that thing? Generally speaking, a lot of what we talk about is the, you know, the life of Henry Shaw, how he founded the botanical garden, the history of the garden more broadly. But if we're consciously thinking, what do I want this person to take away? Everything that we're saying is moving back to that one point, is, is keeping us there in an organized fashion and providing that purpose so that way there's a very clear reason for your sharing whatever story you're sharing. Um, I, think, I think it's very easy to just say, I give every, I, I do the same thing, I give every visitor a very similar introduction. There are times I say to myself, I shouldn't be doing that because this person doesn't want to know the same thing as this other person. Or it's not connecting in the same way because of the way that I'm communicating or words that I'm saying that are distracting them or, or they just hear someone talking and they're like, okay, whatever, you're talking and I'm looking around, you know. Thinking outside the box when it comes to finding those entry points because all of us in this room know the difference between when you start talking and someone's paying attention and when someone's just like, okay, and they'll stand there and let you finish, but they're not really connecting with what you're saying. Um, and, and just being mindful of the fact that there are things we can do to change that communication. Um, I, felt, I felt like we had a really great opportunity with our new volunteers. We had a really good conversation about how to, how to find entry points if you will, to talking to people um, and, and thinking broader, you know, it, it feels like many of us do, we have this feeling like, I'm a volunteer here, so I have to give you this introduction. I have to tell you these 10 facts. I feel obligated to share these things with you. And while 
the hospitality part of what we do will never go away. Our goal is to make sure that all of our visitors are comfortable and they feel welcome in the space. Thinking differently about how those 10 facts are delivered can make all the difference in retention. Um, if this chart really helps us identify what our goals are and what we as an interpretation department really strive for and I wanted to share that with you um, because it really points out you know our goals here in trying to create those relationships between people and the past and and finding those ways to talk about these historic figures that are relatable that are that are not something that just sounds like a story I, I hear a lot that people People say to me all the time, I don't like history. I don't like history. You, you hear that. Because history in the present day is sometimes just a story. It, it's just the same as if you were telling like a fiction novel. It, it doesn't have the, the context or the interest, but you know, there's just so much other content in the world that history is just, oh, well that's a story about a guy who built a house and a garden and it's just a story. But by creating personal relationships, you're creating the opportunity for somebody to say, oh, Henry Shaw is like that? Well, I'm kind of like that. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of OCD about how I keep my records, too. That's funny. Or I like my private life private. I'm like that, too. Creating those connection points for them often allows there to be a deeper relationship that not only encourages people to return to us, but also helps build on what they're learning every time that they come. So we also are always inviting our visitors to think more about the community. Um, as, as much as what we do talks about Henry Shaw and how the garden is built, we're very much talking about the community of St. Louis and how it was built. And, and providing that context allows our visitors to think a little bit more broadly about the fact that this this place is special, but this place is special because all of these people who were a part of this community made this. And creating that appreciation for nature and history, you know, it's, it's very challenging, especially in a historic home, because in the past and for many years prior, the goal was just for people to come in and you take a look around, there's some old stuff in there, it's pretty, and you're just supposed to appreciate it at face value. Unfortunately, and in the 21st century, I will be honest in saying that's not good enough anymore. That, that's not allowing people the opportunity to say, I feel like I belong here. The, the, the look and don't touch and, and just appreciate what you're seeing is not what the 21st century is telling us about museum visitorship. It's telling us that people want to feel like they belong there. They want to feel like they know the people that you're talking about. They want to have those personal connections. And it's our job to be the bridge. They're on the, yeah, the bridge, see? Metaphor? No, okay. Um, and so <laughs> we also do a lot of interpreting of the plant sciences, which I will talk more about here in a little while. But also, providing experiences that incorporate that open-ended inquiry, that's asking those questions so that people want to come back because they know they're going to learn something new, even if it's just one thing. It doesn't have to be all 10 facts in your opening introduction. As long as they've learned one thing, we've enriched their experience in some regard. So we're going to do a little exercise. Bear with me, I know. Just bear with me. We're going to do a little exercise. So I want you to think here and write down if you have a pen if you need to write it down or just think here about a really memorable museum experience so a place that you've been that you walked away either saying that was really great because of X Y and Z or you walked away saying that was terrible I'm never just memorable something that sticks in your mind and that could be anywhere in the world that could be right here if you if you want that but I, I want you to think about a memorable experience, and it could be a museum, it could be at a state park, another historic home, just somewhere where you were relating to somebody who was providing you information at a place like that, and, and it really sticks in your mind. 
So take a few minutes. You can write it or just have it in your mind, and then we're going to share and have a conversation. Who's, who's ready to share what you share. either wrote down or thought of? Yes, Barb, yes. Well, the time, the most current one is I went to the art museum uh -huh. for the men's fashion. Okay. And I had I saw it by myself, but then I went back another time and saw it with the docent. And the, just the knowledge that she had, uh, I mean, it was a much better experience for me. I learned so much, and it made me realize that when I go to look at things, I want to either have a docent or the ear things. I mean, I like to learn things. So for me, it's really important to have somebody that knows, you know, the exhibit and that can help me. Um, and so going forward, unless I have a docent or the ears, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yes. So I will share the day I went to the Herring House. Oh, yeah. that was so much fun. Yeah. And when Peter Weiss Jackson told me that he purchased one of the prints yes. for eight dollars <laughs> yes. to decorate this beautiful place, yes. I thought, gosh, I'm going to go to that. You Say, know what? Can I add on yeah. to that? I go to St. Vincent's Vincent to Paul, and yeah. I go to St. Vincent's Church down in Soulard and I told father the uh -huh. pastor that I said you're going to get a kick out of this yeah, that was <laughs> and I said he said he picked it up in St. Vincent de Paul for a dollar each and he's so proud of him and <laughs> so it's funny yes Dave uh, contrary to, and what Barb just said about, uh, about the docents uh, a couple years ago my wife and I were in uh, Belfast Ireland and we had uh, one of the we went on was the Queen's uh, Castle I think that's the only place she has a palace but anyway uh, as soon as we walked into the door, the docent, the tour started, she did not, and I'm going to use, shut up. <laughs> two solid hours. Oh, How anybody could have done this beyond me. And what was aggravating about it, not only what she took, but she carried a water bottle around with her. And she's, you know, to talk a little bit, drank. The whole two and a half. So I just started walking around. You know, not even paying attention to my wife was having like that. Because I was in the other rooms and they were all in there, you know. But, but it was terrible. So, I mean, overindulgence is that. And, but I agree yeah. with Bart. You yeah. do need, you want somebody right. just to the right amount. calm down a little bit. But on the same trip, we went to Loch Ness. And our tour guide there, she was unbelievable. She was so funny and she was just. Real matter of fact, she told us how phony the Loch Ness Monster was. The only time you ever hear about it is in April when the tourists start coming. Right. And so the extreme difference between the two. Both of them were, I mean, they knew their stuff, both of them, but the one in Ireland, oh, terrible. The one in Scotland, marvelous. So, so you get the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you, Dave. Yeah, Janet. I, I like the at Oakland House. The, yeah. the, I mean, yeah. Oh, she was she's so, very, so very good. She was able to share her stories yes. about how she helped with the renovations and so forth. Mm -hmm. That just I thought was very. She made it very personal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess that's yeah. the personal story. Mm -hmm. And I think she had the just the perfect amount of yeah. you know interest, mm -hmm. but not boring and not mm -hmm. lingering. So yeah, mm -hmm. she was excellent. Yeah, that was a good one. Yes, yeah, so mine is similar to what you're saying, and we were. Uh, in Florida not too long ago, in uh, down near Keys in uh, past Miami, and we went to uh, a historic home, and we were the only two people there for the tour, mm -hmm. which was wonderful because we had a lady who had grown up in that little town by this house, playing in the you know, and and it just made me think of the people who come in to uh, Tower Grove House and have that same experience of. And you know, in the garden, and, mm -hmm. and just you know, having that as like they talk, talked about that was their backyard, mm -hmm. and yeah. so yeah. you know, but you don't always hear that, you know, and and, and getting that out of someone, um, I don't know, it's it's that I think that's the tricky part where you know, unless you ask them their experience, mm -hmm. you know, of, of what what is your experience here, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yes, Jackie. Um, we went to the Molly Brown house in Denver and <clears throat> had my grandchildren with me. So I asked the lady how long the tour was. And she said about 45 minutes and I thought, oh, oh, we're fine. An hour and 15 minutes, she quit. And when we walked out of there, my grandson said, where are we going next? And I said, a candy company. And he said, I don't want to take a tour. <laughs> Endure it for her audience. Yeah, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll do one. Um, 
We were out in San Jose, California at the Winchester House. Oh, yeah. And there is a current movie out. There is. It's not, you know, at every theater, because I don't think it's going to get an Academy Award or anything like that. <laughs> but it is stars Helen Mirren, mm -hmm. and she is Sarah Winchester. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. um, it has to do with her fear that uh, the people that were killed by Winchester rifles, their spirits are coming back mm -hmm. and haunting her. Oh, wow. Now I kind of don't pay much attention to that. But we did tour that home out there, and it was so interesting. And like there was a little surprise. I did not know that that is the largest collection of Tiffany glass in Ooh, the United so States. Oh. So, you know, they don't really put that out too much. Uh, that that is a draw for people, but the idea of uh, Sarah Winchester was if they kept building yep. on this home, that kind of kept the spirits awake. Now the movie takes another turn, and the spirits are in there anyway, and they are after the grandson and all this stuff. But that was a very interesting tour because some rooms were decorated to the period, like mm -hmm. we have. And some were just absolutely <coughs> playing the staircase to nowhere uh, and things like that. So um, I really had a good experience there with their docent because they only took so many people at a time. And you could hear without the ears, but you know, they spoke to you. You had an opportunity to ask questions. They took their time. And um, you know, that was, a, that was a good experience at that place. That's great. Yeah, that's a good that's fascinating place. Yeah, very good. I think we went twice. <laughs> <laughs> I was school out there. Two opportunities. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I just really have a question. Um, expectations for a group tour, like when you travel, to me, that's when they're just lecturing you. I mean, that's what I get. But when you have the opportunity, like we do at Hargrove House, where it's really a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three yeah. or the interaction. Expectations, I think, were completely different. Yes. Um, and I had that when I went over to the Art Museum for Art and Bloom. Mm -hmm. And I usually get the docents, and they're very knowledgeable, but their job on a tour is to give everyone complete information. Yeah. Yeah. But Art and Bloom, you have a chance to talk to the art, the floral artists. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did, I, there were some beautiful ones and some great floral artists, but the one man that really caught me was the man who had to interpret St. Catherine, and it was a Oh, it looked like an enamel plaque almost, very small. And I kept looking at his work, and I did not get a relationship whatsoever. And I think he saw that look in my eye, maybe, and he said to me, you're probably trying to find St. Catherine. Um, she's not there. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, no, he said, I looked at it, and he said, I honestly only felt the spirit of St. Catherine and what she stood for. So he said, my floral interpretation of that is a feeling. Mm -hmm. And he said, so what feeling are you getting? And I said, oh gosh, you're getting love and compassion. And he had mm -hmm. a heart kind of out of sticks and then kind of looked like a dove and all these things. So that was probably the most interesting interaction mm -hmm. that I could have had. A docent yeah. could not have given me quite that. She might have said, it's a feeling, whatever. But he was short and sweet, but it was just kind of neat because I know I had that, you know, um, okay. Right. Nice. You know. So imagine down in the Oceana Art when you get a, a sculpture and they have to interpret that. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to hear the florists talk about this little object. Right. It, yeah. they, they're all really good, but this man really just, I thought, for a, you know, he's a floral designer, not necessarily a public speaker. Right. Mm -hmm. He was very good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to share? I can. We all we all go through. Oh, Jeanette. Oh, I'm just yes, a yes. I'm a I'm a museum junkie. I really am. <laughs> <Yeah, that's laughs> I great. love museums. And, you know, I remember I was visiting a friend in Germany, and the children ex they planned my day for me, what they wanted me to see. So they took me to the chocolate museum, and it was fascinating because it was the history of chocolate, from cocoa beans to they had mice and tea services of chocolate pots of how it was served. Mm -hmm. But it was very hands-on, and again, they limited the number of people going through, and you actually saw you know, cocoa being processed. So it was very um, knowledge-based, mm -hmm. it, it was yet it was entertaining, and it, it really covered a lot of area. Right. And I think that's what I, I always find most memorable, is that if you really come away learning something, you know, it's about the experience and, and seeing something you've never seen before, maybe, and then, you know, experiencing that in a very personal way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for sharing, because a lot of 
what you're what I'm hearing you say has a lot to do with how interpretation is formulated. So so a lot of what you're describing are individuals who, whether they know it or not, are doing certain parts of the interpretation process really well, and that's what's providing you the opportunity to think back in your mind, either positively or negatively, uh, about that experience. So the most, one of the most important things about interpretation is that it's organized, and, and many of you shared guided tour experiences, which are a little bit easier. But even in our case, as informal interpreters, we still have to be relatively organized in that this is advanced preparation here comes in a lot of forms. It's, it's really important, as many of you know in, that, in the house, to say, um, to both welcome people and help them get comfortable, but then identify with them where the boundaries are. So saying, there are three floors for you to visit here, both upstairs as well as in the basement. You give them physical boundaries to help them understand where they can and cannot go. You're also helping give them a little bit of prep information as they start to move through the space that's going to help drive more of those questions later. Um, so that requires all of us to be prepared in advance, to, to be well equipped to not only answer questions, but also to feel like we are in control of the situation. And, and now that sounds like a very, uh, a very strange way to direct that, but, but I am always encouraging, especially our new volunteers, to embrace the fact that when someone walks through the door and you engage with them, you are their person. You are the person that they recognize if they wander all over the house for the next hour, if they have a question, nine times out of ten, they're going to come back to you. Because, because your face has become their comfort zone inside the house. And so having that ability to empower them and say, this is what you can expect from your time here. A lot of us have luck, instead of just starting to talk to them, saying, Welcome to Shower Girl House. Have you been here before? And if they say no, say, would you mind if I shared a little bit about the house with you for a couple minutes? And then it's self-guided tour. Just by giving them the out or just by giving them the expectation of what's going to happen, you're allowing them to say, okay, I am safe because this person knows what they're doing. And then as you start to speak to them, you're building your credibility. You're starting to give them some of that knowledge that's making them say, that was really, they're really knowledgeable, but I'm also having fun because I'm having a conversation with this person that I'm starting this relationship with. And even though that seems challenging on really busy days, you all can surely attest to the fact that sometimes people walk in and you just strike up this relationship with them. You just can easily speak to them. They're just people who you would see out, you know, somebody in your friend group who you're trying to talk to. Once you start creating those opportunities to have a conversation instead of just a lecture where you're walking around and saying things, you're giving them that comfortable space. That's where your goals come in because you're still thinking in your mind, okay, as much as I really am starting to like really like these people, I want them to know these one, two, three things. I, this is what I want them to take away. And then there are times where writing it out can be helpful. So even though I provide things like this that have the content in them, the factual information, I anything that works best for you is totally up to you. I mean, anytime I give any type of presentation, you'll see here, I'm the type of person that writes everything. There are tour, I write tours word for word. And even though I don't go by it, having this organization is going to show subconsciously. It's going to make you feel prepared and make you feel like you are confident enough to give those people that confidence because we are in a very unique situation here in the garden. As many of you know, it's really unlikely that someone is coming to Tower Grove House because they know that we're a historic home. Most people are coming to the garden because they want to visit the garden. They've heard about us. They're, they're tourists from out of town and they know that they should come here. So. And then they're walking into a space after they've walked outside that looks totally different than anything they've engaged with in this space so far. 
So becoming that comfort space for them, not just the leader of their tour, but the person that's really there to both answer the questions and make them feel comfortable to explore on their own is really important. It should be fun. All of us have great experiences with people that make the day wonderful, but I always want to encourage that if you're having fun or enjoying, then they're having fun. And you know, if, if you approach it in a way that says to them, this is like we're at my house and I'm just here to share with you what I know because it's really wonderful, that makes a huge difference than if they're walking in and you're just saying the same thing on repeat and you've done it 15 times, it shows. And, and so having that fun is, is really tapping into where their interests are, what their curiosities are. Many of us have good luck with introductory questions by saying, you know, if you've been here before, what do you remember? Or what was your favorite part the last time you were here? Or if you've never been here, where are you from? Tell me more about, about your visit here today. You know, what, what interests you? Because then you're finding whatever they're interested in. Sometimes that just takes a look. Many of us have good luck if we're upstairs and people are wandering around. You see them looking at a painting. I do this ridiculous thing because I'm ridiculous, where I just like get close to people and just start looking at whatever they're looking at. Because then eventually they start to kind of notice that, like, oh, this person could answer a question if I needed them to. Just no, sometimes you don't even need to say anything. They'll just say, oh, oh, you do work here? Tell me about this. Because you're letting their curiosity and their interest drive what you're providing. Your, your goal isn't just to stand there and say, this painting, blah, blah, blah. Your goal is to provide that support for them and then create a conversation from it. Something that's, that's a bit more, a bit more casual, still organized, but, but something that is going to allow them to have those relatable moments with you. This also offers opportunities to every person that comes in. So, so by creating something that's fun, even if you're just telling a joke or kind of, kind of being silly, they're still remembering it, they're still laughing, they're still saying, I'm having a good time. And if that's all that they take away from their experience that day, I still think that's a worthwhile engagement because you're still contributing to their positive experience here at the garden. They may be learning something in another area and just having a good time while you're involved, but all of those things need to lead up to this enjoyable, I mean, I heard Jeanette say the word entertaining. That's what people are looking for. They're looking to have a good time, to feel comfortable, and maybe to learn something while they're at it. Yes, Bruce? Uh, speaking of uh, giving information, I, I think sometimes it's interesting when people come expecting to see something that you don't have. Uh, I went to the Florida Botanical Gardens mm -hmm. looking for a breadfruit tree, which figures rather predominantly in history all the way back to Mutiny on the Bounty. That's what they went to, to Tahiti to get. And I w always wanted to see one, and I thought, well, we'll have one in the Climatron. Well, they don't. <laughs> well, when I went to uh, the Florida Botanical Gardens, a, a volunteer that I was talking to, I told him what I was looking for, and I said, do you have one? I thought, well, man, if anybody has a breadfruit yes. tree, uh, they will. Well, he went to the computer and he looked it up and he said, no, we didn't have one, uh, but he didn't stop. And uh, when I told him while I was looking, he was very interested. So I'm going to find out why we don't have one. Oh. And he said, going to be here a little bit? I said, yeah. My wife and I walked around and he said, come back out this way. And when he came out, uh, when we came out, he said, you know, it is rather fascinating, and we are rather surprised we don't have one. It has something to do with the size or something. It must be a pretty uh -huh. big tree. But I appreciated the fact that he didn't just go to the computer and say, no, we don't have one. Right. And you really felt like he cared that uh, what you were interested in, yeah. and even though you didn't have it, he tried to give you the information. And sometimes I think people come expecting to see things, and, uh, and I think it's interesting why they expect it. Maybe it's a, a wrong time frame they're in or something like that. So I think you learn a great deal just by 
seeing what people expect to see, even uh -huh. if we don't have it. So. Yeah, and, and making sure that, you know, as you understood that he was doing everything he could yeah. to help you, and, and that impacts the way that you feel about, I mean, no matter what your capacity of wearing this badge is, if a visitor sees a badge and they ask you a question, they, they're looking for the answer. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to find a way to have something to take home with them, um, even if it's an I don't know, or a, I'm gonna check into that, or I'm gonna learn more later. Um, and, and that makes a huge difference about the way you feel um, and, and, that, and that fun aspect, because you still had a good time even though you didn't get your answer, you know, but it, it made you feel good that they were trying. Yes, Elaine. Um. I was just thinking about the third bullet point yes. that is not mandatory to interpret to every visitor. Yes. Um, I, I'm trying to think back to of all the historic homes that we have ever visited. I, I cannot remember any that we would just be able to walk in and go. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, without you know, because there are sometimes when we're all busy and, and we don't catch everybody and, right. and people just walk in and go. Right. Um, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that, um, but but it always struck me as kind of a little bit strange that I don't know there isn't <laughs> some way we can, um, or maybe they have read enough about the house, you know, by reading those and hearing mm -hmm. as they go through. Um, but is it unusual that there are that that this is a house that's open that you can just go? I think the difference, and I and I hear what you're saying. I think the difference in our situation is again. That, that we are not a freestanding historic home that people are intentionally coming to. And that probably in most of the instances you're referring to, we're you're intentionally to right. trying to go there. And, and so that, that need for all of that information is inherent because you're going there intentionally. Mm -hmm. We fall into a situation here where people are coming here for many, many other reasons, mm -hmm. not for a tour of a historic home in many instances. And, and this certainly isn't to discourage anyone from interpreting to a visitor who has a question or looks interested, but I try to make that delineation, especially for our new volunteers, because all of us are familiar with situations where you begin talking to someone and they're looking at you like they're trapped inside of a box <laughs> because because they're they're just not here for that. That's just not what they're interested in. They're, they may not even be interested in gaining one new bit of information about the house. They just want to look around. Yep. They just want to see what, what it is. And then sometimes they look around and then they come back to you and they have like 15 questions. And it's still a very rich engagement. But if you see that someone, even if you've made every effort to be friendly, say hello, offer them, a greeting or the interpretive beginnings and they say oh no we're just gonna look around that's okay that yeah. that, that that there's no there's no shame or force that you should be like following someone and saying do you have a question do you have a question because they haven't talked to anybody yet um, because especially I mean again all of us take our role very seriously and that and that we want to share as much knowledge as we can with our visitors but some people just don't want to do that, and that's okay. We have to we have to respond to whatever they're looking for. Some people are looking for a little <coughs> bit. Some people are looking for everything. They want to know every single detail of every single space. And and it's okay that there are times where there are people who just want to look around, and then they say thank you, and then they leave, just because of this situation outside of the house that's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I just, I mean, yeah, this is just a question in my own mind, mm -hmm. I think, you know, because it was like, well, we just let people come in, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we are open to letting them come mm -hmm. in, uh, but it, it, it's certainly not the, it's different, the it's, standards right, it's non-traditional, absolutely, right. and that's, and that's why I tried to speak to that in, in the last slide, in that, in that you can still be in control of the situation and help them feel comfortable and say, we have three floors that you're welcome to visit that have X, Y, and Z in it and still allow them to be comfortable. But if self-exploration is what they're interested in doing, 
then they're welcome to self-explore and hopefully you can catch them on the back side and say, did you have any questions or, or can I tell you more about this? Well, and we, I mean, I don't, I think you're absolutely right. There's also houses that you can't get into without a scheduling tour, yeah. a tour in advance. Um, but we went to the couple's house on SLU campus. Mm -hmm. There was no one else in there and no one walked us around. It was, <laughs> it was so weird. We walked in, we introduced ourselves. There was, yeah. what, 12 of, 10 of us? 12. Yeah. And so there was a, there was a desk though that you, with, with a young lady, didn't really even say hello. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It, and we, we weren't even really given welcome to the house. Here's a little history. We just walked in and we all went off in all different directions. And I went up to her after the fact and, you know, thanked her and talked a little bit and asked her some information about visitation, which was like maybe 10% of what we get in the course of a year. But it was even more foreign to me than what the house is. I mean, I would like to believe that everyone that comes to the house at least gets to see a smiling face and is welcome. Now, you guys all might not be able to interact with every single person, either because they're not interested or because they're members. And I know Priscilla shared certain people that have come year after year, time after time, and they have personal connections with some of you, but some of them, they just want to see what's different or change. Well, some people so, have been on a walk and they're hot and they just want to come in and call yeah, them. Exactly. Yes, and they're yes. looking for the restroom. So I think, yeah. what, we, I think yeah. what we offer is that, yeah. that personal connection and you guys are meeting them where they're at. And I think that's the, what's important and um, what makes the house as special as it is. So like, if there are a lot of people coming in, then should you kind of... I don't want to say shorten your, but you kind of want to make sure that you can address as many people that come in or, you know, if you. Yeah, that's a good question. So if on a particularly busy day. Like Shaw's birthday. Uh, like in Shaw's yeah. birthday, I, as the staff person, take on that responsibility and go to the door and kind of direct traffic and saying, here, here, over here to my right, Rita's going to talk to you for about three minutes. And then I get as many people over there and then direct them up so that way there aren't people just flowing through. Now that requires some staff intervention to kind of direct traffic and make sure you have a whole group before you begin. But again, that also has to do with their interest level. If You might have a couple people near the front who really want to hear you. But you might kind of start talking and then people in the back kind of wander off. That's okay too. You know, I would say that you should always be modifying either your introduction or what you're talking about based on the kind of feedback that you're receiving, either nonverbal cues or if they're asking you questions or not or just kind of staring at you, you know, taking those communication cues to either continue talking and answer the questions and if others wander off, then that's okay. Um, that's also a good opportunity to exercise that that, that, that friendly control by saying, hi, I'm going to provide you a couple minutes of background information and then it's a self-guided experience because then they know they're going to be free. They know that they haven't just walked in and now they're on a two-hour tour and that they can't go anywhere. Then saying those things helps people know, okay, I'll listen for a couple minutes and then I can do whatever I want to do. Because I know like Dave and I, we worked last year on that Sunday before the total eclipse. I was amazed at how many people we had come in. I mean, I know, I, I think we had like almost 500 people come mm -hmm. in. And it was, it was just shocking for that time of year to have that many people right. come in. Right. That was unusual. And we usually try to prepare for those things. Yes, Priscilla. And the, another time is like when we have Japanese festival mm -hmm. and Chinese festival. Many times there's a flood of people coming in and 90% of them have no interest in giving them anything. So you simply have to smile and try to direct, you know, please go this way, or if you have any questions, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Jeanette is here, or I'm here, or whatever, you know. But sometimes you just have to make that decision. They're not interested, they don't care. But I have my smiling face just in case. Mm -hmm. And then we'll circle the wagons when they come uh -huh. back if I see them. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. This was yes. So this is all great. Does this yes. mean that service dogs can come in now? This I will get to that. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. I'm really anxious to hear about. Service I'm very dogs. close. I'm very close to that. So interpretation should be thematic in that you're continually remembering that. I think we've gone through that quite a bit. And this is a friendly reminder that at the end of the day, we are storytellers. We are telling the stories um, that we learn from different pieces of historic information. Um, but a story is going to catch someone's attention a lot faster than either reading off a script or any of those types of things. So, so remembering that you are a storyteller and feeling empowered in that and, and trying to share this information in a way that's very relatable, understandable, and interesting is our goal. It's also very important that we find relevance in what is on display, in that all of these things are really old. And again, I, I often say all of these things are beautiful and interesting, but they're only interesting if you can tell a story about them. They, they're just things if there isn't a person there to provide some context. Um, and so, so finding whatever that topic is and your audience and where they come together is really important. So I'm sure all of you can think off the top of your head what your favorite thing is to talk about in Tower Grove House. And, and now, does anybody want to share with me how you would connect that to a 21st century visitor? Not necessarily just why you like it, but also how that relates to a 15-year-old kid who has never seen something like that before. Yes, Rita. I mean, to me, one of, the, one of the things that I just marvel at is Henry Shaw's handwriting. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you can read it as legible, it's clear. Mm -hmm. and I was surprised, like, because I was talking to a little, a younger person last and I, oh, I can't read cursive, and it just, and they're like, they don't teach it in school anymore, and it's just like, you know, I, the, I think that the art of penmanship is lost with so many people now that, you know, everything's like sharp burst, and it's just, you know, little texts or messages and everything's, you know, kind of mm -hmm. in electronic mode, and it's not taking the time to, to write it out in hand, and I just think, you know, I just find that totally amazing. So sharing with people that this used to be a skill that you had to acquire, helps put into perspective, you know, that while well, most people now have to take like typing courses or computer courses, this would have been very much an important part of Henry Shaw's life because that's how you communicate with people. You know, bringing that thing, that item of old into the present day. Yes, Dave? Uh, you uh, talked about the younger people several years ago, two years ago at Glow, uh, we were walking through and there was a family that came to there was a young man, oh, I guess he was he was part of the group, you know, and um, so he stopped in front of the plate farmer and he's explaining to his grandmother what this is all about. You know, I said, oh, you know, this is what this is for. And I'm sitting there amazed that this 12, 11 year old kid knew what this was about, didn't say a thing, you know. So he walked out of the room and his mother was saying, I said, I want to compliment you for your son being so, I said, where did they learn of all that? She said, you told me that last year. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, though, but we remember that's it. That's right. Yeah. That's, but that's the perfect example of how you, of how you remember things, because you talk to him about something that's like the early version of a microwave. Yeah. He, yeah, had, he, was, he had the, the 21st century context to put it in, and it stuck in his mind. He that's so the perfect example of that. That he was telling his, his grandmother yes. about this. You know, I think, yes. well, this is one smart that's, kid. That is a... That is a check the box for making connections because yeah. you were able to use yeah. that as a tool yeah. something that's current that he understood in his yeah. life and relating it to something historic yeah. I know I know this the they check the box yes I find it's interesting too talking about the connection between your topic and your audience that you know there's there's details that I choose not to share with certain groups like mm -hmm bits and pieces about the bathroom yes certain groups i would never even bring up the toilet because toilet feels you know if it's a group of little old ladies that i feel are a little too proper to mm -hmm. even say that word mm -hmm. whereas with younger people you could even mention the name of the man who allegedly invented it you know and mm -hmm. there's that funny little story there and what about the chamber pots upstairs yeah mm -hmm. you know just that to the little ladies. subject matter that sometimes feels <laughs> less appropriate with certain yes. that's true right. that's true that age appropriateness yeah. goes in all directions yeah yes yeah. does anybody else have a favorite thing that they have a lot of good luck 
connecting people with. Well, yes, I think it's the dining room table, and I talk about it being on wheels, mm -hmm. and why you think it's on wheels, and then talk about the fact that we had to move the table so we could get the light. Or light. Yeah. A lot of those things, especially when you start making those types of connections, help people think outside of what they're accustomed to. So most people are accustomed to just turning on a light and they're being like, um, but you providing that context of how things are different is comparing the past and the present. And, and, and we as humans in the American school system are accustomed to compare and contrast. That's something that, that we're all accustomed to having done from school days. And so those things tend to work with even adults. Um, I mean, the situation you described with the kid also works because it's a kid. And kids are being trained to put together, here's this piece of information and this piece of information and how they go together or how they don't. And, and those compare and contrast things do tend to work and make people say, oh, I never thought of that, which which is them learning something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about ten years ago, when I became responsible, when interpretation became responsible for the house, um, I learned a lot from a lot of the seasoned volunteers. And one of the things that I think when I went through the house with some of the volunteers that really connected with me was the plate warmer downstairs, and how they shared with me. Well, if you think about, you know, how do you reheat your food today? And this is Henry Shaw's version of the microwave. Yeah. And so it's always yeah. stuck with me yeah. because of how they were able to relate the then, because well, why, why would you need a plate warmer? Well, what do you do today? When you come home or you know, whatever, you want to reheat something, what do you use today? Most often times you're probably going to use the microwave versus reheating your stove or, or And even things. simple things so, work. I mean, a lot, of t a lot of people ask questions about the painting, like the woman upstairs right. in Henry Shaw's yeah. room. They ask a lot about her because they presume that she is of some sort of importance. Mm -hmm. But most often I just find myself telling people, what do you have on display in your house? <laughs> things that you like, things right. that you think are pretty. Mm -hmm. Henry Shaw thought this was pretty. Mm -hmm. Here it is. You know, there's, there's a very simple train of thought that we still use today that applies to mm -hmm. people. You know, there, there are many instances where, where visitors think that, oh, people in the past are so much different than us and we have different thought processes and all these there people are really not that much different than they were before they're making decisions based on aesthetic and what they like and 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 it's very simple in a lot of ways which leads me to my next slide like um, and and finding these opportunities to share personality traits so so instead of just giving some factual information like Henry Shaw was, um, you know, concerned with his, you know, reputation and just saying, oh, he moved the townhouse here to, to the garden grounds before he died because he wanted his legacy to be intact. That's factual and you can give some facts about that, but until you start to put into context that we all do this in some way by writing a will or by making plans before any of us plan to leave this earth, people say to themselves, oh, well, I guess I do that too. This isn't, he just had a lot bigger things to put in order. Or saying things like, oh, he, we don't know a lot about the women that he dated or what his personal life was like. If you start contextualizing it by saying, you know, I don't really enjoy putting my stuff out on Facebook. I'm not telling people what's going on in my life. But a lot of people do, but. <laughs> But you're, you're allowing that opportunity to say, okay, this is how I am, and, and this is how he was. You know, the, the, those descriptor words allow people to think outside. The seriousness I love because so many people want to know those really juicy details. But by saying he kept really rigorous records of all of his <coughs> business plans, you can say, you know, he probably was the early version of a workaholic. And a lot of that gets a lot of laughs, like, oh yeah, me too, you know, that that those types of personality traits are what are relatable, not the facts, but by pointing out the traits, you're able to connect people to to that person. This is my favorite analogy ever. <laughs> because you here are this Velcro. You are what are making these 
these wonderful historic moments stick because you're taking whatever the visitor comes to you with, their background knowledge, their interests, what they may or may not know, and then you're trying to find ways to adhere this new information to their brain. And as we've talked about, there are moments of success and sometimes we can't figure out what that person is looking for or wanting to learn. And that's okay too. But you are what is providing that bridge that Velcro to make that information stick. And that comes through all of the communication things that we've talked about, all of the different methods that we try to employ. I just wanted to share a lot of these things because I think it's a good reminder. It's something I could hear every day because it's so easy to fall into what you do every day. It's, it's so easy to just say the same things all the time and to just, and to just say, what comes naturally to you. Eventually it's just a natural thing that flows out of you. And, and as much as I appreciate having that somewhere inside of me, I, I don't want it to be natural. I want it to be organic every single time I talk to a new person. And that way I'm tapping into what they need and thinking about what they need, not just what I want to say. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're gonna move forward here a little bit because we're running low on time. I wanted to, to put this beautiful museum building up on the screen because it's opening. And so that's a very exciting thing for the garden. It's going to be something that's very new for us to figure out how to have a neighbor because we've kind of been the little island out there in the Victorian district, but the Victorian place, district is becoming the place to be, let me tell you. There's a lot going on out there and things Presumably, in terms of even just visitation, we'll be busier this year because there's more to see out there. There's a draw of something new that's going to be right next to us. People will be coming in, even if it is, again, by accident. But, but this part of the history of the garden is really becoming something that we're sharing more with visitors. How we collect, how we share and have, and have put together plant knowledge for 150 years, like, um, and, and really sharing how we've cemented ourselves as one of the top research facilities in the nation. Um, and so this is really a cool thing. Um, again, we're opening here at the end of April. The most important thing that all of us will rejoice for, bathrooms, yay, bathrooms, accessible bathrooms. Many bathrooms. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. Family restroom. It's just, it's so much. As well as other visitor amenities. Vending machines, places to sit down. Besides a really cool building to see, there's going to be lots of really great stuff in there that are going to help uh, help all of those visitors we've been hearing crying all year because they haven't had a bathroom. Bless them. Um, but again, like I said, the Victorian District is really starting to come together. Uh, I really enjoyed starting to get to know Neshka, our new museum curator. Uh, she's wonderful. You're going to love her. Uh, she's a firecracker. And we are really, um, I'm really excited about the path that we're forging to make the Victorian District its own attraction. In that, uh, just like you have to go to the Japanese Garden when you come here, you also have to go to the Victorian District because there is a lot to see out there now. Like I mentioned, the new planting plan for the Victorian District yep. is gonna make things look different visually on the outside, um, as well as infuse a lot of historic planting into the, you know, the, the stories we can share about how planting methods were different in the Victorian time. Um, I really feel like we're starting to really come together and we are an island no more, so. Um, be, be excited. Yes, Roddy. So we talk about the, the area for the new plant case. Is it just that little space to the side and, and in the back like where the maze is at? Uh -huh. or like what area are we really talking about? But actually it's the entire Victorian district. So um, the parterre, the, part the Victorian garden, the pincushion garden, the maze, all the around the museum building, the stumpery, building, pretty the much stumpery done. around the Herring House. And so Herring House was sort of the first one. Um, but horticulture is looking at the entire south e southeast quadrant of the garden and really, I don't want to say making changes because sometimes everybody's like, change what? It's so pretty. 
they're looking at it with a, a historic focus and focusing on the history of botanical collecting, the history of um, horticultural science, some things that are different, some things that have been modernized, but a lot of what we do today was done back then. Some things have been modernized, but some things are really traditional. Making improvements and really making connections to that um, plant conservation at the garden. So as we, as we know more, we'll, we'll be sharing that with you. Yeah, I'm hoping um, that one day a document similar to this will live for that, and that you'll have more information about, about the different Victorian sections, history. but just about planting and the plant science behind that, as our as our horticulture colleagues tell us more. And as it gets installed, that that clearly that takes quite a bit of time in terms of planting to, to, to make those changes. So mm -hmm. that will be something we might see throughout the year. That's also important for you to know because there might be times where the parter is looking a little empty. Mm -hmm. And so visitors will ask what's happening and, and you're able to share that we're really trying to get back to what, what the history of these types of spaces and, and planting in that era would have looked like. So, so know that changes are afoot. So the garden continues to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The garden does continue to grow. It's intentional. Which yes. leads me to my next slide. See how I'm doing this here? I'm really good at this. We are very excited to share with you that we um, are in the process of renovating uh, on a, on a year-long journey to renovating the bedrooms in the second floor in the east wing. Cool. So that's very exciting. It's a big project um, and something that we're very excited about. The narrative, I will share uh, much about the, Dr. Trulis and his family, of course, who lived in that area. Uh, of the house, which which seems instinctual, but also we, I know how many questions we get about architectural changes to the house, uh, as well as technological changes, so the bathroom and those types of updates. It will also share the expansion of the plant collection, and you might think hmm, that's rather strange, but without Dr. Trulis and his contributions, especially, we would not be the plant collection that we are today. We would not be the organization in terms of research uh, and, and cultivating that we are today without him. So, so finding ways to tell stories about how plant collections have happened traditionally. Um, we're also hopefully going to share even even up till the 1920s when Washington University used us as a as a classroom. You know, the, the house has had many lives since Henry Shaw, yep. and I think we're doing a really good job talking about Henry Shaw at this point, and now it's time to also share a bit more of that garden history. So any idea when that will be complete? Yes, so um, because, of, because of the feedback um, that, that we get over, over the course of time, we're doing this a little non-traditional. So, so right now we're in the process of doing construction types of things. Um, but we will be open, those rooms will be open to the public in some form or fashion at the end of April. So oh, we, will yes. be, we will be taking our visitors on the journey of this renovation with us. Um, so the rooms won't be finished. They'll, they may in fact just be some white walls with some furniture in them. But our intention is to share how historic house renovation happens, um, how how, what kind of process you go through because it isn't just throwing some wallpaper on the wall and calling it good. You can't go down to Lowe's and pick up wallpaper. No. Yeah. So, so sharing with our visitors, we've been documenting it really heavily, photographs, video, mm -hmm. things like that, where we can show our visitors, okay, these are all of the things that go into creating an engaging space for our visitors. I know, I know. All of us do home improvement in some way. I feel like that's a very that's a very comfortable conversation for a lot of our visitors, as well as many of you. So, so finding ways to really bring them along with us, because in many ways it is disingenuous to just open a perfectly finished room and just say, we pulled well, out our magic wand. So think of what was done with the house between um, in 05 when it was renovated, restored, and reinterpreted. Think of all the questions that you guys get today about some of the work that was done. Wallpaper, floor, um, artifacts, carpet, things like that. How equipped do you feel to answer all those questions? 
Now, think of if you had film, photos, stories from that time that we could give you to equip you to better answer those questions, how better would you feel when you get those questions? We're hoping as we go through this process over this year to bring you along with us so that you have all of those personal stories and the photographs and the narrative so that you have that now with this new project because unfortunately we did, the, for some reason that wasn't really done prior to. Well, that will also encourage members who yes. could use a reason to come back in. Yes, so exactly. Done that, right. So, in, so in theory, right. by, by this time next year, in all hopes, if you know how construction projects are, but in all hopes, mm -hmm. then, then there might be a completed room for someone to see. And, and, but for us to be able to say, this is all of the work that we've done in the last year to make this happen. Right. Um, it's also important to note that these rooms are a combination of interactive and display areas, uh, which means that what you will be seeing are not going to be necessarily the traditional room like you're looking at at Henry Shaw's side. So there may be an area that's a no touch or roped off area, but in hopes that there'll be many more feet areas in that room to, uh, to allow for engagement, to encourage hands-on interaction, um, to have a lot more space to do more than just look and touch, um, and, and to tell those stories in different interactive ways. Yes, Elaine. So Haley, the, the workers will continue to be working in the rooms as the house is open, and the visitors will be watching the workers work in the room? It so depends on what, what that might be. So, um, as you can imagine with any household renovation, the timeline sort of has been kind of going all over, and so, Right now, we'd like to contain that to just Mondays and Tuesdays when the house is closed. But as the, as the days and weeks go on, I can't quite give you 100% that no, they, won't, they will only be working on Monday and Tuesday, but that or, is... Or that there's a possibility that one of the doors is shut that day and you have to tell a visitor well, that we're doing, doing this type of right. work. For now, the east side will not be open until the end of April. So meaning the restroom, the bathroom will not even be able to be seen by the public. Okay. Because what we're doing is just closing the east side, making sure that as much as we can get done, we'll get done. And then when the museum building has its member preview, the east side will be open that evening and then would be open to the public um, that Sunday morning. So we're gonna sort of, yeah, we're gonna do a dual. Uh, What's some evening. signage that says this is what we're doing? Right. This is this is what this is going to be. These are the stories this is going to tell. Uh, so that way, our our members are also getting an idea of how we work. This is how we plan these. Right. These are our floor plans. These are you know this is how we do the work that we do, um, and hopefully garner some interest in the project in that way also. That way if some work does have to happen and it's on Thursday morning, it's not while visitors are trying to walk through the east side before April so that we could okay. keep the guys in, in, okay. in a room if we needed to, but yeah. our hope is not to have to happen. So again, this is another opportunity for us to ask for your patience right. because things could be changing uh, on a weekly, daily basis based on this project and how construction mm -hmm. projects work. They do. So, so we're going to try to mitigate <laughs> how that interacts with our visitors, but we're going to do our best to try to help them uh, as long as you all are helping us share with our visitors what we're doing, what the future of this is going to look like, and get them as excited as we are to, to see what that final product is going to look like. Yes, Jenna. I just had a comment. Would it be possible to have like storyboards or something yes. on the second floor landing if people can't access the east side oh, sure. just temporarily and yes. explain like what you're saying the vision of what we're doing behind closed doors yes so, so we're in the pro process of trying to create some of those um in informal signage if you will kind of boards that mm -hmm. that are both going to share the work that's going on in the room what the vision is what the narrative you know some of those narrative points the stories we're going to tell and the ultimate goal is to have bedrooms become bedrooms again with Furnishings for the most part, yeah. So, so um, we all of these things manifest themselves in different ways. And telling the story of Dr. Trillis, we do have plans for more traditional bedrooms. The room that's currently across from where my office is is going to be more of a um, 
not there's no there's no ropes right now in in planning but it will be more of this expansion of the plant collection story so it will be set like a desk that dr trulis would work at and then would have other exhibit panels that tell more of the chronology of the rest of the house after dr trulis's tenure um, so that one's going to look a little bit different um, in terms of it not being a traditional bedroom um, but might look more like an office of some sort Will your office still be? Yes, yes. How many bedrooms are there? There are four, including the office. So, so that will be three rooms that we'll be adding. That's great. Yes, hard work. There's lots to do. But I wanted to share that with you. You also received this information via email. So that way I was telling everybody at the same time. So those of us that could not make it today have the same information. Right. And I've made it. <laughs> to the end, yes, Andrea. Uh, will you will you talk about the service dog policy briefly? Oh yes. yes. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the reminder. Sure. Yes. So I did hand out a service dog policy uh, in those documents that you may have gotten up front. Um, we wanted to formalize um, after after seeing some 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 need or having some questions about about having animals inside Tower Grove House. Now that feels a little non-normal because it's a historic space but service dogs are really important to a lot of individuals that visit the garden um, and so we wanted to clarify the ways to engage with those individuals who do have service animals and there I would say service animals and it's clarified in there what service animals are and I think what's really important for everybody to know is that um, service animals are welcome anywhere in the garden those individuals who have service animals are to be treated as any other guest. And myself, Haley, and all of us in this room, hey, hey, should never ask a visitor anything about that service animal. Because you need to assume that they've already been vetted, vetted up front. <laughs> and unless there is something that is of concern, uh, the animal is in the house and it's acting up. The animal is lifting its leg, it is best for you if you take it to the staff person and let the staff person address the situation. Um, there are a lot of reasons I you can probably imagine as to why we don't want to have dialogue because you could say the wrong thing and it's completely unintentional. And so we've tried to educate staff across the board. Everyone from horticulture to my team to visitor services. Um, it could be someone from institutional advancement who's simply walking from the south end to the north end. Just say hello, how are you doing today, and walk on through. The other thing to know is years ago, all service animals were supposed to be uh, identified with jackets, collars, scarves, what have you. That's not required today. And so we don't want any of you to be put in a situation where have an awkward conversation so it's just better to just address the individual if there is a situation take it to a staff member and and just know that they are, are welcome everywhere in the garden yeah mm -hmm. yes yes um this is a little bit ridiculous but i see a pro and i'm very safe not what it says here uh it says uh any dog or miniature horse yes, yes. <laughs> okay so if we're in the house and somebody is coming in with a miniature horse i mean we figure let them in because they've already been cleared by uh, security. I know the, the chances of that happening are almost impossible. I, I can't wait for that. But the fact is, it's part of a miniature so horse. So that is according to ADA, the American Disability Association. It's too many acronyms. So the only um, animals that are currently vetted as service animals in the world generally are dogs and miniature horses. No peacocks. No rabbits. We've had a rabbit that was in a <laughs> stroller. stroller. Yep. Um, so all animals should have been vetted. Unless Absolutely. there is a concern, take your concerns to the staff member in the house and they will take care of it. Take right. care of it. Is the house constructed? Is the construction of the house? architecturally sound enough to support the weight of ours. I would hope so. I guess we'll I, find out. You know, I don't even know if a miniature horse would be able to make it up the stairs. A yeah. miniature horse might be smaller than a big dog. Yeah, I think the four probably. Yeah, that's... Yeah. 
When you look at a great day, yeah, I don't know. I think that's a really good picture horse. Please take a picture close to something. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah. I hope it's when Dave's working. <laughs> oh, Dave. So far, this will be the year that that happens, but so far, a miniature horse has not visited the garden All right. other than a Clydesdale yeah. as scheduled. That's the horse. I just wanted to mention we had the only incident I can remember with a service dog I think was that we they just arrived. We didn't know they were coming and we had children that were afraid of dogs and mm -hmm. people that had allergies. And that was the only time I can remember that you know you had no forewarning. They just right. appear at the door. So you have to be kind of anticipatory. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, it gets a little bit challenging because they are welcome, they serve a purpose for that individual who needs them, and, and you can't necessarily say, I'm sorry, you can't come in the house because we have someone who's afraid. It's, it's really a challenging situation, so it's just best we've just been advising all we the volunteers. We just say, Priscilla, they're here. Yes. Priscilla, <laughs> Kayla, Kyle, anyone. Here. <laughs> if the miniature horse is in a stroller, the stroller can yeah. That's right. If the miniature horse is in a stroller, the stroller can yeah. in the house. Yeah. 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 Yeah.